Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us as we conclude the Progress Seminar. Typically, we wrap up the Progress Seminar with a Sunday morning conversation, usually of a political nature. We're keeping that tradition alive with our final segment. It's a fireside chat without the fireplace. We are thrilled to be joined from Washington, D.C., uh, by Voice of America's White House Bureau Chief, Stephen Herman. And Stephen, welcome to the Progress Seminar and happy birthday, sir. Excellent. So I need to tell my uh, trusty crew here, I can't, I don't have Steve's yes, I, uh, audio. I, I unmuted now. Thank you. There we go. Birthday. Awesome. Hey, fantastic. <laughs> Hey, thank you for being with us, sir. Um, I personally am super excited that you've taken the time uh, to be with us today. Steve's career uh, has taken him all over the world, and he has spent over 25 years in Asia, including Japan, India, Korea, and Thailand. He has covered some of the most important events in the recent past. He is an author, a columnist, and frequent commentator, lecturer, and presenter. Steve has engaged and served in leadership positions with numerous press organizations, and in his role as White House Bureau Chief, he's had a front row seat to history. If you have not done so, please read Steve's full bio for a full understanding of his remarkable career. We can't do it justice uh, in the brief intro time we have here. But Steve, welcome to San Mateo County and welcome to the Progress Seminar. I wish I could be there uh, in person. Uh, I'll make the only biased comment of the day. You all live in the most beautiful part of the United States, and I'm very envious. <laughs> Well, we are biased as well, and we totally agree. Um, so I thought we'd begin, begin with just a little bit of background on what Voice of America is. Can you describe this? Uh, people might think something along the lines of the BBC. They may be familiar with that, but describe what Voice of America is. Well, um, if you're um, uh, from the United States or grew up in the U.S., then uh, there's really no reason that you would be too familiar with the Voice of America, because it is purely an external broadcasting service, 100% part of the federal government, but is under an independent agency. And I think we're going to talk more about that in a bit. It started um, just after uh, the beginning of the U.S. involvement in World War II. And um, when I uh, give presentations in, in person, I usually throw out a question for people to guess what was the first VOA language uh, and the second. And uh, some people get it. Uh, the first was German and the second was Japanese. We have 47 language services at, the, at present, radio, TV, multimedia. German and Japanese are not two of those languages. VOA has been constantly evolving over the decades. And we are focused on uh, serving countries, regions, and languages and peoples uh, that uh, do not have access to a, a free press or are living in uh, developed uh, areas where, uh, although they may theoretically have a free press, uh, there's not uh, a robust uh, infrastructure media organizations uh, that um, can serve them very well with uh, uh, objective news and information. So uh, some languages uh, uh, come and go. We've been known to add languages and restart language services on very short notice, uh, depending on what's happening in the world. One joke I've always had, if uh, uh, the uh, overseers are trying to eliminate a VOA language service, that means probably in six months, something's going to happen in that part of the world. And uh, we've seen that in recent years. Uh, with the Russian service and Greek services being uh, uh, targeted, uh, for example. Um, some of our um, bigger and more strategic language services, of course, are uh, Mandarin uh, uh, targeting uh, China, uh, as well as uh, uh, Farsi for Iran. Um, and then uh, some of the others, which are much smaller, are also uh, very important and strategic to all of us, such as Burmese and uh, Tibetan 
and uh, our language services in the Horn of Africa. If you've been following the news, although it's been kind of pushed out because of all the post-election news, uh, there's a lot of uh, very serious things happening with Ethiopia and Eritrea. And uh, that is a, a part of the world, Horn of Africa, that we serve with numerous language services. Yeah, so Steve, I just got a little production note here. Uh, your audio is a little soft. We want to make sure we're able to uh, get you at full. Audio. Okay, and let's so, see if this is any better. There is you that, go. Can you hear me better now? I think that I think that should do it. So thank you very much for okay. that, sir. So so we're used to uh, private news organizations, the major broadcaster, uh, cable networks uh, that are all independent. Uh, Voice of America, the state-owned, state-funded news outlet. Um, how does that affect the way you cover stories? Uh, is it any different than any other sort of mainstream news organization that we're used to seeing uh, when we turn on our, our cable news? Right. Um, I, I think a, a better analogy, uh, which I can speak to from personal experience, is I came from the Associated Press. I had worked for a wire service and the style of writing stories and presentation is uh, a very similar to that. I think one difference is, is that because we are writing for a non-American audience um, and also our um, news copy and TV and radio reports are potentially being trans, uh, translated into so many different languages that it's a very straightforward style of writing. You don't wanna get uh, too flowery. You wanna get straight to the point. Uh, you don't want to use uh, uh, complex uh, uh, phrases that might not translate well. So uh, that is that is one big difference. Um, but uh, we're not um, considered uh, a propaganda service, um, although we will explain um, uh, about American foreign policy. We are also in our charter. Uh, mandated to reflect um, all points of view in the United States. So no uh, single administration is supposed to use us as um, some particular uh, bias projection of its policies. Of course, over the decades, there's been a lot of uh, wrestling uh, about that. So uh, you are the face and voice of, of the U.S. in many ways to the world. And I, I just am curious about your presentational style. If you're mindful of that, you talked about using shorter phrases. And I watched a summation you put out about where we are with this presidential election. And uh, I, I could tell it was, it was a different style of presentation and language than you might see on a CNN. Just uh, describe how mindful you are of that as you're presenting this information really to the entire world. Right, I'm, I'm very mindful of that because uh, as I said, when I'm writing uh, a sentence, I have to be aware that someone in our Swahili service or our Korean service mm -hmm. is going to want to um, uh, translate that and then uh, if they can't figure it out, they'll call our central news desk and ask uh, what the heck I'm trying to say uh, in, in the story I'm writing. And um, I also frequently go on the air on uh, uh, foreign broadcasters um, in Africa, in Asia, also uh, BBC World Service quite frequently. And again, uh, I know that I'm speaking to a non-American audience. Um, if you're watching um, uh, cable news in the United States, it's sort of like a soap opera, right? There's We're on episode 4,239 of a continuing saga, and you don't have to explain the backstory of all the characters. Um, but when I'm writing a story or broadcasting a story, I have to realize that the, the person listening to that in Uganda um, or in uh, Vietnam may not have the same level of uh, familiarity as uh, an American audience who's uh, following every twist and, and turn uh, every single day with the saga. And of course, uh, that's also true, you could argue, of people in the United States too. And maybe um, we don't, uh, the domestic broadcasters and, and, and journalists writing stories in the U.S. don't take a step back and, and really put it into, into context uh, all the time as perhaps they should. 
Tell us about some of the biggest stories that you covered. Are there particular stories that stay with you even today that uh, will come across your mind on a routine uh, basis that really hang with you? Yes, um, I've um, been in this uh, business um, more than uh, uh, 40 years, uh, obviously not all with VOA. I didn't join VOA as a staffer until 13, 14 years ago, although I had been a contract reporter for VOA in Japan before that. And um, I was just reminded by my brother today that uh, 40 years ago today, I was covering the MGM Grand Hotel fire uh, in Las Vegas, where I was uh, living at the time and working for the public uh, TV station there, Channel 10. So uh, today, I, I remember going in 40 years ago today uh, with the firemen and the charred uh, remains of the of the casino. And uh, I won't describe everything I saw. It was really horrific. Uh, but, you know, even something from 40 years ago uh, sticks with you. Um, I've covered a lot of... Um, uh, disasters, in, including uh, the aftermath of the Fukushima Japan uh, uh, tsunami and the nuclear disaster. I was, um, I, I think, uh, for a, quite a period of time, the only uh, non-Japanese um, uh, reporter quite close uh, to the reactor when it was melting down. Um, I've been uh, spent some time in uh, in war fronts, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka. Uh, so it's not necessarily any particular moment, but but sort of um, going in and out of those places uh, over a period of time uh, that um, created for me, uh, you know, somewhat of a familiarity and a great fondness for places uh, that a lot of people in the world wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, oh, really, that's a place I, I really want to spend a lot more time in. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, most of my career has been in Asia. And I also say I'm ABC, Asia, but China. I know just enough about China to say that I'm not uh, a, a specialist on China. And um, uh, so I, I have done reporting from China as long as, as well as Hong Kong, Macau in Taiwan. So I have some familiarity with it, but I and by no means claim to be a, a, a China expert, which I think is a, uh, you can spend an entire lifetime focusing on China and, and still not uh, be very astute at, uh, at, at the history, culture and, and what's going on there. So given the bulk of your work has been in Asia, in both democracies and quasi-democracies, do the same kinds of journalistic freedoms exist uh, there? Is that your experience or is it a, a different uh, tone and tenor to uh, sort of the government uh, watching what's happening? And uh, is there, what, what is the perception of the United States and where we stand right now in our democracy to, in Asian? Yeah, great questions. Um, well, e each country, I think, is different and, and somewhat fluid. Uh, you can be in a country covering something and all of a sudden the welcome you had at the beginning of that story uh, from uh, the government uh, is, is no longer uh, such a warm welcome. I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed back in Fiji. Uh, they were not uh, happy with uh, some reporting I did there many, many years ago. Um, Vietnam, uh, although it's a country I, I love and fantastic people and uh, it's, it's very dynamic, that is an especially tough one uh, for foreign uh, reporters. Um, now, I have been back in the United States, uh, although I've traveled um, during the past four years with the Secretary of State and the President and Vice President, so I have dropped in uh, to uh, a number of foreign countries, but as far as being based in them day to day, uh, I've been out uh, for uh, uh, four years now, uh, but when I was based in Asia, uh, I would say in uh, most countries, the people uh, were very curious about the United States, uh, respected the United States uh, with, with rare exception. And I think you'll find that even in places like Iran, where um, although uh, governments uh, in some of these countries may be traditionally perceived as anti-American, uh, the, the people really are not. Um, and um, 
you know, this is this is something that does evolve from administration to administration and also depends on whether the United States has been in, in some sort of conflict with that particular uh, country in recent history. Yeah. So you mentioned traveling with the president and the vice president. So I'm a political junkie, Steve. We're just now meeting virtually here. But uh, so you've ridden on Air Force One. What is it like? to travel on Air Force One, and did you uh, steal any souvenirs from the big <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I am asked about that from time to time. I've probably done, I, I've actually lost count of the number of flights I've, I've done on Air Force One. It's uh, many, many dozens, but <clears throat> perhaps uh, short of a uh, hundred. And um, uh, the only things I've uh, taken from from Air Force One is they have these little uh, uh, plastic uh, Tabasco uh, bottles with uh, with the logo uh, of the president on it. I've I've uh, flinched those from time to time. Uh, I do know of other reporters. There's one uh, fairly uh, prominent uh, reporter who. Uh, uh, she has uh, confessed to uh, to taking glassware and silverware off the plane <laughs> over a number of years. She shall uh, maybe remain the statutory nameless. Statutory limits have run out. She shall remain nameless. I uh, I don't have that gut those guts. Now the first time you do fly on Air Force One, they will send you a certificate uh, signed by the uh, the pilot that you've been a guest of the president on Air Force One. So that's a that's a nice souvenir to have. And of course, another one that I should mention are um, the M&Ms and um, they are um, assigned by the president. They're back in the, in the press area of the plane. And uh, we, we, we always try to, to take those um, uh, for, for souvenirs. Uh, kids and adults uh, love those. Now, I, I don't know, do you know what, why the M&Ms ended up on Air Force One? Do you happen to know the history of that? I do not. Please educate okay. me. Okay. They replaced uh, packs of cigarettes and matches. Uh, <laughs> Nancy Reagan put an end to that. Uh, so until the Reagan administration, uh, I believe there were still uh, cigarettes and smoking <laughs> on the plane. And uh, that, that definitely doesn't uh, happen these days. Yeah. So can you actually file your stories? Can you work from Air Force One? I mean, is it set up as, um, I mean, it's certainly not set up as a studio, uh, like the one you're probably operating in now with that backdrop. But uh, can you do work on Air Force One like you do on a normal plane? Well, well, yeah, we can get out our laptops and work. We do not routinely have access to Wi-Fi. The staff has access to the Wi-Fi. They do not turn that on uh, uh, for us to file our stories. Air Force Two is a bit more generous. I think the vice president, whoever the vice president may be, is always happy to get publicity. And so they're much more generous with turning on the uh, the Wi-Fi for us to file stories. I've had that happen a number of times. Uh, when news breaks on Air Force One, we actually get to all share a telephone line. And it's like something out of the 1940s. We pick up the phone, uh, we get an operator, we can place one call, and then they call us back and we have, we have to dictate uh, uh, the story uh, to our respective news organizations. And I should mention when I'm on Air Force One, although I'm a, a VOA correspondent, I'm actually the radio pool reporter. So my job is to get the audio from the president or whoever speaks on the plane or on the trip and feed that as quickly as possible to all the radio networks uh, in the pool. So it's not that there's a VOA seat on Air Force One. There's a rotational radio pool on Air Force One. There are permanent seats for several of the wire services, and there are also uh, uh, photographers and a, and a TV crew of three, a, a producer, a videographer, and a, and a, and a sound person uh, that travel on the plane uh, as well. So there's a total of 13 media seats. So I'm not on every flight, uh, but when our rotation comes up, uh, then then I would be uh, on the trips. Another thing I should mention is uh, because I may have to record audio within a few seconds notice, the president could come back unannounced. Even on the long flights to Asia, I can't take a sleeping pill and knock myself out uh, in, in case the president walks back. And inevitably, he usually walks back when I've got a tray of food and, and a hot beverage on my tray and I have to 
figure out how to move that uh, uh, quickly to get into position. Uh, so the trips, especially to Asia, can be very grueling. They're, they're sort of seats between economy class and business class. They're not the full reclining seat. So it is kind of difficult to, to sleep if, you're, uh, if, if you don't fall asleep easily without knocking yourself out. And then uh, the president may be very well rested uh, during the trip. We usually have a, a, a fuel stop in the middle of the night somewhere. It might be Hawaii or Crete on the other side of the world or the UK. And then it's morning time in Asia and you have to hit the ground running. And I've had days that have gone 18 to 24 after a nearly 24 hour flight just to get to the place. So uh, it may sound glamorous, but it can be really, really exhausting if you're on that plane uh, uh, yeah. because you're supposed to be working and reporting. I would imagine. So you uh, transitioned to White House bureau chief and have been covering the Trump administration. I think it's fair to say the Trump administration has been a departure on a variety of fronts, norms, things we ex uh, normally expect from uh, a presidential administration. And there have been attacks on the press, uh, this talk of, of fake news and those kinds of things. How has covering and, and, and traveling with this administration been a departure from previous presidential administrations? Yeah, certainly. I uh, had covered uh, parts of some presidential trips in previous administrations, but uh, you know, never was a part of the White House press corps to the extent I was these past four years, and I uh, uh, literally volunteered for it on election night 2016 because I knew it would be unusual, unprecedented, and um, and very challenging. And uh, uh, fortunately, my uh, bosses agreed. I had been covering the State Department for the, the, the previous eight months, the end of uh, uh, John Kerry's uh, time at State, and I did one trip uh, with Rex Tillerson to Mexico, and then I transferred over to the White House early in 2017. And uh, I think it's fortunate that I had had extensive experience overseas, uh, dealing with all different types of governments that have uh, various uh, adversarial relationships with uh, domestic and foreign media. And also that I was older. I think uh, it was a shock to maybe some young reporters coming onto the beat or also those that had only covered the Obama administration. Although we must point out uh, that uh, all was not uh, kumbaya between the Obama administration and the White House press either. Um, it was a very interesting history there as well. Um, but my approach to it is to never let it get to you personally. Do not take the attacks personally. And there were many uh, directed from the president on down uh, at VOA and, um, and, and sarcastic remarks uh, to me sometimes. Uh, I'm there to do a job. Uh, it's not about me. Uh, and to, to really keep focused on what you're doing and don't let anyone throw you off your game. I'm sure many of you uh, can empathize with that in, in your careers as well. Uh, you're there to do a job and, and you have to do it professionally. And there are people looking deliberately to trip you up. I think what was very unique about this administration is, is that the media was seen as very polarized. There was a lot of media uh, perceived as being, uh, you know, out to get the president. And then there were some elements of the media that uh, were were there uh, uh, very much as a, a cheerleaders of the president. And uh, the wire services, and I would say VOA, despite our government connection, uh, was, was, was trying to take a more objective approach. And of course, that upsets people on, on both sides of the political expect, spectrum who feel that you should be on, on their side. And uh, to me, the, 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 the major problem really is what I call an issue with news literacy and confirmation bias, uh, where people are tuning in uh, to the news or trying to get information that just validates their pre held opinions of something and aren't not, not necessarily looking to be intellectually challenged or to hear things that they may find uh, uh, uncomfortable. So that has been an increasing challenge over the years and, of course, is not just limited to, to the White House. 
Right. So um, as we talk here today, Steve, we have a sitting president who's not acknowledged the results of the election, has refused to concede uh, to this point. Uh, last night, a Republican, Mitt Romney, tweeted out, having failed to make even a plausible case of widespread fraud or conspiracy before any court of law, the president has now resorted to overt pressure on state and local officials to subvert the will of the people and overturn the election. It is difficult to imagine a worse, more undemocratic action by a sitting American president. And I know uh, you're not really in a position to opine uh, in, in depth on this, but do you think there's um, a concern about enduring damage to uh, our small d democratic institutions in America? And sort of where do we go from here to try to pick up the pieces uh, with regard to attacks on the press and, and things that we've come to accept as, as really the pillars of our democracy here in America. Yeah, I I always say that um, journalism is is sort of the first snapshot of history, and I'm not a historian. I'm acting in the role of a journalist, so I can only sort of develop what the snapshots are uh, of the day. I do try to draw on history from time to time to put things into context uh, uh, for our audiences. Uh, if you go back uh, to the election, what was it uh, Hayes Tilden, uh, 1870? I mean, there there was that was a pretty rocky uh, post-election period as well. Uh, but besides that, there's really not been anything in American history like we've seen now. Um, obviously, what happened uh, between Hayes and Tilden uh, didn't uh, destroy the process or the republic. Um, uh, of course, we went through a, a civil war in the mid 19th century um, and just how serious this is all going to get. I, I don't think anybody can reliably uh, predict, but uh, this administration has been about the overturning of norms and the people that voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and presumably again in 2020. Uh, were uh, in support of uh, overturning uh, the norms. Um, and um, it, it is a, a little bit uh, uh, surreal uh, because uh, reporters uh, don't want to be thrust into the position of um, calling uh, uh, the president of the United States or top officials uh, liars, and uh, it's a term we, we obviously try to avoid. Um, but uh, the Voice of America, among other major, major news organizations, has um, called the electoral vote uh, uh, for uh, Joe Biden. We refer to him as a president-elect, and uh, that's the approach that we're uh, taking uh, towards all of this. And I think with the exception of very few, few uh, news agencies, um, there is a, a determination that Joe Biden has won the election and will be inaugurated on January 20th. So give us a sense of the mood in the White House on election night. And the, the president was basically radio silent for about a week. Uh, did the, the press pool have any access to the president during that 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 short uh, radio silence. Well, um, he has really not taken questions from any of us um, since um, election night. Now he is having an event. I think it's just about to start uh, scheduled for two thirty Eastern time in the Roosevelt room where he's presumably talking about prescription drug prices. And we'll see in a few minutes whether he answers any questions. Now, the press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, just a couple hours ago, held her first briefing uh, since the election and took a, a small number of questions, uh, of course, uh, not referring to Biden as president-elect and, uh, and, and Vice President Pence just a few minutes ago in Georgia uh, said that uh, we have to make sure that uh, every illegal vote is thrown out. So that gives you the official stance of what we're hearing uh, from the president on down at uh, the moment. But uh, Georgia's certifying its votes today. And so I think what we're going to see is sort of a step-by-step -step, uh, process. Although I think most of us uh, in the White House press corps do not 
expect to ever hear the words said by Donald Trump that I lost or I concede. Right. So uh, Voice of America broadcasts to the world. What has the reaction been to President-elect Biden and just what is happening now as we go through this very rocky transition? Yeah, I, I think uh, Joe Biden was not really well known to most of our audiences uh, when he was vice president uh, under Obama because uh, Obama was was such a a, a towering figure. And uh, then, of course, uh, during this campaign, uh, Donald Trump was really uh, dominating uh, the interest as well. Uh, so there is um, a tremendous uh, curiosity. I think for uh, some of our audience, there's as much interest and curiosity in Kamala Harris as there is in, in Joe Biden, because uh, she is breaking so many uh, barriers. And as a woman of color with roots in Asia and as an African-American, and we broadcast uh, to, to Africa and to Asia, there's obviously a, a tremendous curiosity about her. So, Steve, we want to engage our audience as best we can. Uh, we want to tell people to post your questions in the Q&A section uh, of the uh, software here. And Michael Brownrigg, a local official here in the city of Burlingame, uh, chimes in here. He's a 12-year U.S. diplomat. He really appreciates VOA and all it did to speak truthfully, often in, a very, in very muzzled countries. In today's world where President Trump has diminished our standing so badly, both by his values and policies uh, expressed, which seem so at odds with the values we have always preached overseas as well, just not caring about what foreigners think. VOA is more important than than ever. So we asked a couple of questions. Um, what does VOA think uh, about its editorial positions when our president and so much of the country seems isolationist? Are you forced to look for lowest common denominator kind of storytelling, or can you still stand up for traditional American values of democracy, trade, open elections, international rules, and so forth? There's a lot there to that question, but if you can take a stab at that, Steve. Well, I, I can tell you, um, uh, during uh, the, the past four years, um, no one has um, stepped on uh, the reporting of me or my colleagues. Now, there are some isolated instances in the last few months that have popped up in the news, but uh, uh, as far as um, is, is my reporting, um, nothing has changed. And uh, we do try to examine uh, these issues in depth. It's not uh, a question of lowest common denominator. I think we are cognizant of, of bending over backwards to uh, reflect uh, uh, different points of view. And um, look, our copy is out there, uh, the TV and radio pieces, anyone can, can see them. Everything's in the public domain. Uh, we have websites in dozens of languages, and um, I think if there was some sort of um, uh, bias or we were sort of uh, falling short in our reporting, it would be very obvious to our stakeholders who include not only our audiences, the members of the public, the taxpayers, and uh, members of Congress uh, as well. and. Uh, we would be facing some criticism if um, if if that uh, were the truth. Now, uh, have there been elements of the government in recent years and over the decades that have not liked what VOA has reported or have tried to push it in a, a certain direction? Uh, I my master's uh, thesis was uh, devoted to, to much of the history of this, and as I like to say, there's always been a struggle for VOA's soul. Uh, some people think it should be a mouthpiece of any particular administration. Some people think the government shouldn't be uh, uh, doing this um, at all. And there's been concern about uh, a VOA or Radio Free Europe and other U.S. funded broadcasters as potentially um, uh, competing with uh, commercial broadcasters. I, I can remember about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there was this uh, thought, oh, let's just let uh, CNN do it. But uh, I think if most people were to watch CNN these days, they would say, you know, you'd really have to ask the question, are they going, are they really drilling down 
on a myriad of international issues in their reporting. And they're certainly not doing it in the way that we're doing it in so many different languages. Yes, CNN does have franchise um, uh, uh, broadcasters where they uh, they have their own service in Spanish and, and I believe there's a Turkish service and some other languages, but um, you know we're not we're not in the business of making money at CNN. Of course, um, the bottom line is is what they're doing has to show a profit. They rely on advertisers and subscribers and all that. So being free of that as a journalist and a broadcaster uh, gives us the opportunity. Uh, to do the types of stories that are not necessarily going to uh, bring in commercial ratings. So, Steve, your career has coincided with the advent of the Internet, the rise of social media, and you talked about the concerns around confirmation bias and people sort of selecting uh, news and commentary that reinforces their, their views of the world. I have to think this is one of the reasons we have such a polarized country. Uh, President Obama was interviewed on 60 Minutes recently, and he was just talking about uh, how divided not only the politicians are, but how really divided the voters are, the fact that Donald Trump got 73 million uh, votes. Uh, it's a divided country. Just talk about the dynamics there. How do we uh, turn this around in this media landscape that we have how do we make sure that people are exposing themselves to different points of view that don't necessarily coincide with their their long-held views and, and beliefs? Well, I think for those of us at VOA, that's that's relatively easy because we have different reporters on different beats doing different types of stories every day. And um, unlike um, uh, some of the, um, the, the cable television networks that have uh, staked out a particular niche in the in the political spectrum, uh, we're we're free from that, and um, I'm not in a position to lecture uh, my colleagues in uh, uh, commercial media. I always say is, as a reporter, you should be comfortable with what you're doing and and who you're working for. And let's face it, there are ideological reporters. There are activist journalists. This issue literally just came up uh, in the press briefing room today when when the press secretary ended after just taking five questions and said, I don't take questions from activists. I don't know if she was referring to CNN sitting in the front row or a freelancer who was yelling questions in the back. Um, she did take a question from uh, a reporter who wasn't supposed to be in the room per the protocol of the White House Correspondents Association due to social distancing from the One America News Network, which a lot of people would say is an active, activist network because it is not objective in its reporting on the um, on the Trump administration. If you've never heard of it, it's it's a, a small, uh, very uh, pro-Trump um, cable uh, TV news uh, uh, channel. So uh, we also have to work with, um, you know, the biases or preferences that that particular uh, government press people uh, uh, might show in 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 trying to box those out who are going to be critical of them. And again, this is an ongoing issue. Uh, it changes over the decades. Uh, I think a lot of people like to lament how politicized and polarized the media is in the United States right now, the domestic media. But if you go back to the turn of the 20th century, uh, when, you know, in major cities like New York, you had, what was it, 15 daily newspapers? And, you know, they went uh, across the political spectrum. If you were a socialist or a nativist, there was a there was a New York City newspaper for you to pick up uh, every morning and afternoon uh, that would reflect um, um, your um, your political preferences. I remember that from decades ago in the Bay Area. Uh, you know, obviously the the, the Chronicle and Examiner <laughs> were very different uh, newspapers uh, with 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 uh, their um, you know political leanings as well. 
Yeah, so what does that mean? If I could just ask you a question and, and a reminder to our audience, post your questions in the Q&A and I'll make sure we uh, get it to Steve here before we have to wrap. But just media culture generally, um, there's been a, um, a shrinking number of, of local and regional newspapers were served here by the San Mateo Daily Journal, uh, a free uh, local daily that focuses on local news does a robust job, but in many uh, markets, regions are, uh, around the country have a shrinking number of news sources. So I guess a broad question about sort of where you see the media landscape going. I mean, social media will continue uh, uh, to exist and expand, and just sort of the market segments are getting smaller and smaller. Um, how mm -hmm. does that affect the kind of job that you do, how you look at the role that you play, and are you concerned about sort of some of these global trends, if you will, in just the overall media landscape and what it means for democracy? Yeah, I'm I'm I am very concerned about it as an American and a journalist. Again, in my VOA environment, I, I'm sort of insulated from that. I don't have to worry about being laid off uh, because uh, my publication's been purchased by a hedge fund or is merging uh, with, you know, another broadcaster, uh, things like that. Um, I, I'm pessimistic in the short term and optimistic in the long term, I guess, is the way um, that I would put it, um, because um, it's obvious that the traditional uh, for-profit models are uh, no longer working. I don't think the hunger, though, for accurate, reliable, quick news and information at both the local level and the national and international level is going to go away, putting aside the news literacy issue that we talked about. Um, it, it's probably uh, going to be someone in your neighborhood there uh, that's going to figure out uh, the entrepreneurial model that allows um, the type of traditional journalistic values to survive. I was just reading an article yesterday about Substack being a, a fairly lucrative model for a number of freelance journalists and columnists. And, you know, I've been looking at this for uh, a number of years. I was in the past involved. I helped start up Discovery Channel in, in Japan and, um, you know, dip my toes into some entrepreneurial media projects uh, over the years. And I kind of believe that uh, the end solution uh, lies somewhat in a micro payment model. You know, maybe I'm not going to want to pay $10, $20 a month to 20 different uh, entities, publications, and reporters. But maybe if I click on an article and it costs me literally two cents, uh, a lot of those clicks uh, can can add up into a real income from the, the person who uh, uh, authored uh, that content. Uh, so my hunch is that's probably more of the the model, and you know, we see even with uh, what's happening in 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 traditional television, cable TV, with cord cutters, and, and such now. And you look at the um, the demographics. The I was saw something the other day for, I think it was both for Fox and M MSNBC, who are both on the left and right, of course, uh, about uh, where the pers the large chunk of their. Uh, viewers are in terms of age and it was really on the high end of the scale so unless somebody figures out how to make people live to 150 literally their audiences are going to be dying off soon uh, so um and and things are, are changing as, as you well know there um you know i'm very active on social media uh, uh you know I, I thought i was on the cutting edge you know being on on twitter from 2008 but I'm not on uh, 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 TikTok, uh, for example. So, you know, am, am I a dinosaur now because I'm not singing my stories in 15 seconds or less on TikTok? I don't know. Well, <clears throat> you and me both uh, on that score. But um, let me ask you just one final question about this Trump transition. Um, uh, incidentally, I'm going to be presiding 
over the Electoral College here in California when the 55 electors wow. meet in our assembly chambers and, and um, we'll be, I'll be presiding over those uh, proceedings and uh, those certificates get uh, sent to Washington. But is there any danger that the Electoral College won't function like we all expect? It is a, a rather sleepy affair every four years. It's certainly a slice of history, so I'm, ex I'm excited about it because I'm a junkie. But is there any chance that it won't work as we might expect? Uh, is there any way that um, the president's going to continue to run out the clock until January 20th? I mean, I, my assumption is when January 20th comes, this transition happens and life will go on. And this will be a very interesting historical episode, this administration. But are you hearing anything that we're not, that uh, there may be yet more unexpected uh, twists and turns to yeah. this uh, political drama? Yeah, I concur with your assumption, but I'm also hearing um, from some uh, people in the Trump campaign camp that uh, the president is going to fight this until the end. And uh, if there is no other alternative, would like to find a way to disrupt the electoral college process. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know. Um, you know, there's been a lot of commentary that, um, you know, if um, Rudy Giuliani is is at the forefront of your um, uh, legal team, uh, then um, it, it probably doesn't have a high uh, a degree of uh, success. Right. Um, but I, I think the answer to that is um, uh, stay tuned. As Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. And um uh, I know that uh, among the, the Democrats in the Joe Biden camp, uh, until there is that uh, certification in mid-December and then the uh, formalities uh, in Congress uh, in early January, that it really is not over. Something that we've always taken from granted in the past is not something we necessarily can take for granted in uh, 2020. Yeah. I'm old enough to remember when Rudy was America's mayor. Um, right. a question from Danny Gasparini. Who has been the best presidential press secretary you've worked with and why? Well, <laughs> that all depends on your uh, uh, a definition of um, uh, best. Um, uh, the best ones are the ones that call on me frequently and, and answer my questions, right? <laughs> so... Um, I um, uh, was in there from uh, the time of um, uh, Sean Spicer all the way to um, uh, the current time. So that's the um, that's the pool that I have uh, to, to draw from in answering that question. Um, I did uh, get along with uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I always found her to be um, respectful of me. Uh, I did have a number of off the record uh, conversations with her, including expressing my frustrations when she did not uh, call on me uh, when I had what I thought were important geopolitical questions and we were able to uh, work things out. I would say uh, since uh, she uh, departed, that we have not had press secretaries that have done uh, very frequent briefings. And although a lot of people, of course, thought that uh, Sanders was uh, very partisan in her approach uh, compared to uh, her successors, um, she did do more of the traditional press secretary part of the job than her successors. I, I, I think that's the diplomatic way to answer that question. Yeah. And you think we'll see a resumption of the White House correspondence dinner? CNN's, or pardon me, C-SPAN's big rating spike of the year when they do that, when they do that dinner. But uh, with Trump and certainly the pandemic, we're all living through. Um, it, might we see it post-Trump, post-pandemic uh, resumption of that uh, fun night where where Washington pretends it's Hollywood? Yeah, I'm a member. I'm not on the board of the Correspondents Association. Uh, the dinner was not held this year uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, President Trump uh, did not um, show up when it was held. 
But yes, I would expect now next year, I can't say that there's going to be a dinner. I think it's, it's how far along are we uh, with, you know, the fourth wave of the, of the coronavirus pandemic at that time. Um, but uh, I, I think definitely during the Biden administration, we, we should expect that there will be a return to the dinner and the president also uh, showing up. There are some in the association who think uh, that the dinner kind of got away too much from its original mission. It turned into sort of the Oscars East Coast uh, and, and a lot of the correspondents and, and were, were sort of uh, chided for, for trying to compete with the something out of Hollywood. Uh, and it's, it's basically a fundraiser for, for scholarships. And I've, you know, I did express uh, uh, my feelings to the association that, that we shouldn't have a guest speaker who is overly political, that we should be reflecting a more neutral framework and stick to our mission of uh, making sure that this dinner is a good fundraiser for, for scholarships. Got it. So, so you live in uh, suburban Virginia. When you get a day off, that rare day off, uh, what do you do for fun? And somebody tells me that you have an interesting hobby, and I want to learn about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I live in uh, Northern Virginia, sort of a historic hamlet going back to land in the George Washington family, although I have a very a tiny third of an acre uh, slice of that. Uh, but my wife is a, a gardener, so it's important that uh, she, she doesn't have something that's just uh, um, a concrete. And um, I have to tell you, during the past four years, I really haven't had time off. I've worked six, seven days a week, 12 to uh, 18 hours a day. Um, believe it or not, I do like to travel. I do like to do, you know, boring things like uh, uh, hiking and reading. And uh, I'm, I'm a ham radio operator, so maybe that's my uh, my. Um, interesting that, subject that is, is that it. it and the ham radio yeah. operator did that that preceded your journalistic work or you 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 discovered yeah. that hobby along the way and did but did that have a some inspiration there are you becoming quite literally the voice of america yeah. a absolutely i i was interested in shortwave listening as a kid I, I think the first station i did pick up was the voice of america uh, then in uh, middle school, I got interested in getting my ham license with a, a buddy of mine. And uh, I really do give it a lot of credit. Uh, if you've got any school teachers out there, uh, ham radio in the schools is, is fantastic. You can teach geography, physics, electronics, uh, addiction. Uh, I think it helped me overcome uh, some childhood uh, shyness. I'm definitely more articulate. I have a familiarity with geography. Uh, I always thought initially that I would be behind the scenes in the broadcasting business. I was more fascinated with the, um, the electronics part of it and the equipment. And it was, I got into journalism in, in, in junior high as well. And everything sort of came together, I think, because of journalism classes in school and uh, in getting a, a ham radio license. So I, I give the hobby a lot of credit for helping me get to where uh, I got uh, these days. So last question that I have, Steve, um, mentors along the way, people that you uh, maybe even idolize, but in a more personal way, helped you along in your career. And just talk about the importance of mentorship and maybe even what your message might be if you sure. were talking to a bunch of, of younger uh, students, people aspiring to be journalists, what some uh, some practical nuggets of advice might be as, as you uh, Yeah, as I you think bid there were... Yeah, two, uh, two uh, really important mentors. One was the late Florence Beebe, who was my journalism teacher in seventh grade. She also taught uh, special ed, so she had tremendous uh, patience and uh, taught us the fundamentals of journalism, which I cherish to these days. And uh, the other is the uh, uh, relative of uh, somebody you may know there, uh, Bill Buckmaster uh, in Tucson, Arizona. And you can ask uh, Amy Buckmaster all about uh, Bill. And he hired me at a radio station in Las Vegas in the late 1970s 
and uh, basically left me to my own devices to go out, work as many hours as I wanted, gave me a little bit of uh, uh, nudging uh, here and there, but was uh, generally just willing to, to take a chance on a, a teenage kid. Of course, we were getting paid the same as I think the people working in the convenience stores <laughs> were making, but uh, I felt like it was the, the greatest, richest uh, job uh, in the world. So, and I am a very active as a mentor in the Asian American Journalists Association, the, the South Asian uh, Journalists Association, uh, Society of Professional Journalists and other groups over the years. I always uh, like to have protégés. I learn just as much from them as, as, as hopefully they learn from me. I think it's very, very important. And, um, and, and uh, I, I will always be giving back. I hope to, to end up uh, after I burn out on this uh, totally in, in academia, either part-time or full-time uh, but but rather than teaching something in theory to to be teaching um, a journalist uh, hands on, uh, I, I think that's uh, uh, really important. And now more so than o- ever than the other thing I'd like to be involved in is is trying to expand news literacy uh, uh, programs in schools. And I think this is perhaps something we probably need to start maybe in elementary school. Uh, later, you know, fifth, sixth grade or something like that, uh, because what is the good of everything that we're doing in journalism if uh, people can't tell the difference between a well-researched, nuanced and uh, unbiased uh, news story and, and some crazy piece of Russian disinformation that's popped up on their Facebook page? Totally concur, sir. Steve Herman, Voice of America, what a privilege to talk with you, sir. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this today. It's been a a real special program. So thank you so much. And we wish you the best of luck in uh, coverage of the Biden administration, which is looming. Thank you, sir. And with that, we'll let Steve go. And we want to thank all of our attendees here at the Progress Seminar. We have one final message from the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. And with that, I'm going to toss it to my district director and the president of the board here at the chamber, Mario Rendon. Mr. Rendon. Thank you, Kevin. And on behalf of the board of directors, it's my pleasure to once again thank you all for attending and being part of our first virtual progress seminar. We hope you found it informative. We hope it was worth your time to tune in. Uh, This last interview was just fascinating to to hear uh, Steve's insight. Um, A few quick shout outs and thank you. As always, thank you to all our sponsors. We couldn't do this without their constant support. You you know who they all are. And so just very much thanks to them. Very special thanks to Amy Buckmaster, Felicia Vasquez, Maggie Fahey, Chamber staff for the, all the work that they put into producing this event. Um, Penn TV for being here in the studio to, to film it, to make it all work for all of us. And then on a personal note, a very special thanks to Assemblymember Mullen, Roseanne Faust, and um, Supervisor Carol Groom for being the co-chairs of the Progress Seminar. And then one final shout out before I let you go to lunch uh, to the Connect 20 team, Larissa Okanada, Zach Ross, and Marcy Dragan. For those of you that tuned into Connect 20 on on Tuesday earlier this week, thank you for, for pulling all that together. So hopefully this was great for everybody and we will hopefully see you maybe in person next year. More to follow, obviously, uh, with the holidays approaching. Be safe, spend time, even more time with family, and uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person sometime in the near future. So thank you.